Gentleman from two. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I first do want to thank the gentleman from 15 and the chairman of Juden Rules with respect to the work with them and the others did in amending this treaty bill. The amendments are important. I'm not as convinced of the e efficacy of the, those amendments, but I think that they do improve definitionally some of the questions we had originally. This treaty was written by bureaucrats, for bureaucrats. And we were concerned about the implications the last session. I think we need to be more concerned about the ramifications, not that the implications are not important. The issues touched on are several. Legislative authority is being addressed, administrative law, our tripartite balance of power is being addressed, checks and balances, international oversight, privacy rights, and indeed, state sovereignty. Imagine with me for a moment, arriving this morning and seeing a crowd on the steps, a big hubbub surrounded by, surrounding some object. You wander over to it to see what the turmoil is about and there's an object there standing way above the heads. Why, it's a paper mache horse with a placard around its neck. As it turns out, the paper mache is $100 bills, $46 million, and the placard says, for the children. Our eyes are on the money. Our minds are on the children. We bring it in. Who cares what's inside? It's all about the money. It's all about the children. Given the database uh, access we were addressing earlier, Edward Snowden could give us a hint about some of that. Maybe these definitions and these amendments are going to address that and help that. But make no mistake, the ramifications of this legislation are large. I think it's interesting that we don't have the legislative power to call ourselves back to override a veto of the gentleman on the second floor, but that gentleman has the power to call us back if money is involved. Federal, federal budgeting, this stick that's been used as soon as we started questioning the verbiage in this treaty, as was mentioned earlier, it just seemed to accelerate. The numbers got bigger. When I sat down with the health and welfare people originally questioning 1076, the number was $46 million. Seemed to come out of her hat, but I, I'm not going to question that. Now the numbers are anywhere from, what, 16, 19, 205. Pick a number. We're talking about lots of money. On the other hand, compared to what? I'll get back to that in a minute. I think there's another interesting contradiction. We talk about a balanced federal budget. Hundreds of billions of dollars are borrowed every year by the federal government, and that money comes to the states. If the federal government is to stop borrowing that money and balance that, how much pain is Idaho going to suffer? $46 million isn't that much, certainly $16, $19 million isn't that much, but that pain we heard today in the committee will be huge to those nonprofits, let alone the children and families we're trying to address. But compared to $18 trillion of federal debt, and I use $46 million because that's the figure they kept talking about. Health and welfare was appropriated two billion six hundred and fifteen million eight hundred and eighty nine thousand nine hundred dollars of that a billion six hundred and twenty three million four hundred and thirty six thousand seven hundred dollars came from the federal government
1,623,000, and we're worried about 46? We can't shave 46? Well, actually, that's the stick. If we don't pass this, it's interesting that that's the stick. What is so important in here that this has got to be passed when we're already able to function collecting child support? But, but saying no to federal money will inevitably involve pain, and that's why we don't do it. No state could withstand a balanced federal budget because we simply cannot stand the pain. It's interesting, this carrot and stick issue. It came after the substance of the language was questioned, and certainly we know what the carrot is, it's, it's the money. But what was the story with the stick? All of a sudden, we were going to be stripped of access to all this information. All the federal enforcement tools. When we talk about American exceptionalism, we talk about a will, an ability and a willingness to work around an issue, to get to resolve the issue. If these tools are taken away from us, are you telling me that Idaho has no innovation at all to figure out how to continue to collect these, issue, these, these uh, funds that are due from fathers and mothers? Certainly, we have the power to work around. There's more than one way to skin a cat, and that's what America is all about. If this tool is gone, make another one. Create another one. Why is it that every time these issues come up, we're presented with one option? Yes or no. Not, how about this? How about we work that in? None of the other options are ever, it's always yes or no, up or down, especially when it comes to the federal government. So let's look at the effects of ratifying this treaty. There's got to be a reason that all 50 states have to pass the same language. So the federal government can take that and go to The Hague and say, we're ratified. Well, it certainly empowers the bureaucracy, doesn't it? And it enhances administrative law. And I think this is the crux of the matter. Administrative law, by definition, carries no constitutional protections because they're waived when we voluntarily put ourselves within the jurisdiction of the administrative court. Appeals, alleging any errors, stays within that bureaucracy. You've got to exhaust all administrative remedies prior to even getting to the judiciary, which, by the way, is the third branch of the government designed to protect everyone from any due process or substantive violations of their rights. Even these amendments, which I think are critical and important, do not address the issue of the burden of proof. If an individual has found themselves subject to enforcement, let's say that their account is wiped out, they call the bank, the bank says health and welfare has had an order. Call health and welfare and say, what have you got here, what happened? Well, we've got an order from, let's just say France. Well, can I get a copy of that order? I'm sorry, uh, privacy rights don't allow us to divulge that. Contact the court in France. What if you'd never been to France? What if there was a true error? What if the bureaucracy made an error? You gotta go in and prove that? How are you gonna prove a negative? Well, let's suppose you find that court. Well, there's the order from France. I got it, my name, my social security number. Who's got the burden of proving that this shouldn't be, it's you, it's the individual, the obligor. So we're not helping that individual by changing the burden, we're forcing more of a burden. And they don't even get to go to the court, they've gotta stay within the administrative branch that's doing the execution of this judgment.
The other thing that is very seldom addressed in administrative law courts is that you're guilty and you gotta prove yourself innocent. They've already taken an action. You find yourself in front of them because that action has taken your money, taken something from you, and you're in front of them, and you've got to prove that they shouldn't have done that. That's completely topsy-turvy to our constitutional basis. And yet, no question about it, the Administrative Procedures Act is growing by leaps and bounds in every state and the federal government because we continue to empower the administration, the administrators, the bureaucrats. The database issue, wage withholding, new hire database, federal tax offset, all of these are going to be stripped away. I think it's interesting that the Privacy Act applies to individuals, but not to governments, not to agencies. So what good is the Privacy Act if the power is held by the agencies and they can get any access to any data about you, me, or anyone else. And what do we see on page 36? Nothing in this act shall be construed to prohibit the exchange of data or information from any other jurisdictions. That's protection. Nothing shall be construed to prohibit the exchange of data or information from other jurisdictions. Let's look at the international influence on a state bureaucracy. That's always a good thing, right? We trust the international UN. We trust as long as they're big and powerful, we, we're just going to go along. One thing nice about bureaucracies, they don't care where the rules come from, just as long as they have them, because the rules benefit the bureaucrat. They make their job as easy and simple as possible. We understand why, but it doesn't mean it's just. It doesn't mean it always serves justice. With respect to the judicial power, this, this idea that I, I'm trying to present that the judiciary is kind of cut out of this deal, one can understand why. They are a bureaucracy themselves. They are underfunded. They over, are overburdened. And they probably don't want to have to deal with these child support orders. It's just more of a burden on, on them. But make no mistake, without judicial protection of constitutional rights, the bureaucracy is left to apply its rules in a constitutional vacuum. The judiciary must play a part, a role, whenever enforcement of an order is being placed, taking your money, taking your freedom. That's what the judiciary is there for, and we're cutting them out of that by this treaty. And I think that's the crux of the treaty. I think that's why the stick is there, because given a chance, bureaucracy will be one, and it will control all of the nations. Look at page 28, line 25 through 29. I find this fascinating. And, and why does this have to be here? A tribunal, by the way, that's a court, may not review the merits of the underlying order. If the judiciary, as established by the Constitution, is designed to protect individuals, why is the judiciary forbidden from looking at the merits of the underlying order? Why? The t due process protections built into the bill at line 37 and continuing thereafter on page 28 onto the next page switches the burden. It deliberately switches the burden of proof to the obligor. Passing this bill benefits federal government. It, it, it benefits the government's ability to take, 
the ratification to the UN. With the treaty in place, there's no way for Idaho to change its mind. State sovereignty over each and every issue represented by the text in this bill is directly and literally threatened once the UN, once the treaty has been accepted. State sovereignty, well, I get it. Some say that it was never such a thing as state sovereignty. Some say that we lost it in the Civil War and that it's now a fabrication. Whatever may have remained of state sovereignty, we've proven one thing. It's for sale. If you believe the, the fiscal note, it's only 16 million. But it's for sale because we have our eyes on the money. Let's vote against this bill. Let's just stand up once. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Is there further debate?